Hello, and welcome to uh, Oregon State University Foundation's final webcast of the 2020 Knowledge Break series. My name is Casey Farm, and I am the Director of Alumni Relations for OSU's College of Public Health and Human Sciences, and I will be your host for tonight's talk on zinc. Uh, for tonight's webcast, I am pleased to announce we've had over 1,000 people register, so a very big welcome to each of you attending this evening. Before I introduce our featured presenter, I am pleased to introduce OSU's provost, uh, Ed Fazer, who would like to share his greetings from the university. Ed? Good afternoon, I'm Ed Fazer, Provost and Executive Vice President of Oregon State University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's Knowledge Breaks webcast sponsored by the OSU Foundation. Today, we'll learn about how diet can help us lead healthier lives with a specific focus on zinc. OSU's research in health and wellness can be found in every corner of the university and in all of our colleges from fields like pharmaceutical sciences to bioengineering to nutrition to public policy and to many other fields. What makes our work in this area particularly impactful is its deep connection to community outreach. Our College of Public Health and Human Sciences, for example, is one of the only such colleges to combine public health and human sciences under a single academic home with community outreach programs built in through its linkages to OSU Extension. Our connection with OSU Extension then enables students and faculty to join hands with thousands of people across Oregon in every county uh, and in many global communities to support public health and wellness. Today, you'll hear from Emily Ho, Executive Director of the Linus Pauling Institute, who will talk about the Institute's cutting edge programs in nutrition uh, and its community outreach programs. Our research and outreach at OSU is made more impactful and better through our partnership with the OSU Foundation and with the support from many alumni and donors like you. I thank you for contributing to our, uh, our scholarship at OSU. You help us achieve our land grant research mission. I'll now turn it over to the moderator, but let me say uh, thank you for being with us today and I hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you, Provost Fazer. As I mentioned earlier, we have a sizable audience tonight and many of you have already submitted questions for our speaker during your registration process. She will get to as many as she can, in addition to those that will be asked during tonight's live Q&A portion by the end of her presentation. Speaking of which, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will find a Q&A chat button and you are welcome to type questions at any point in time throughout the talk. Let's get started. This summer, Dr. Emily Ho became the endowed chair and the director of the Linus Pauling Institute, OSU's internationally recognized research center on vitamins and micronutrients. Dr. Ho came to Oregon State in 2003 after completing her doctorate in human nutrition at Ohio State University and her postdoc at the Children's Hospital Oakland Research Institute and UC Berkeley. She joined the faculty of the College of Public Health and Human Sciences and became a principal investigator of, with the Linus Pauling Institute. And for the last past eight years, she was the endowed director for the Moore Family Center for Whole Grain Foods, Nutrition and Preventative Health. Dr. Ho's path into nutrition research began when she was an undergrad student back in Ontario, Canada. She is an animal lover and had entered school with the plan of becoming a veterinarian. But it was a summer research project that steered her into the field of antioxidants and the idea of potentially preventing disease by eating the right foods. Today, Dr. Ho is internationally recognized for her research on nutrients and chronic disease. In fact, her work helped drive dietary recommendations for micro micronutrients, including zinc. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Emily Ho. Welcome, Dr. Ho. Thank you very much for being with us, and we look forward to your talk this evening. Great, thank you. Uh, I want to welcome everyone. One of the, the silver linings of uh, 2020 is the the proliferation of virtual technology and events like this has, that's allowed us to bring uh, so many more of you uh, here to Oregon State and the, the Linus Pauling Institute. So, so thank you for joining us. I'm actually at the Institute currently. Um, if you see here on the, the slide, uh, the, the, uh, this is a 
picture of our, our building and I'm right here on the, uh, the, the third floor. Um, so, so welcome. So at the Institute, uh, one of our uh, main missions is, you know, how do we promote um, optimal health through cutting edge nutrition research um, and trusted uh, public outreach. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share with you some of the, uh, the research that we're doing here um, at, the, at the Institute, uh, where researchers, including myself, uh, are both highly committed to discovering um, and enabling individuals and communities to, to tip the balance uh, towards uh, optimal health. Uh, we really embody the the, the passion and the essence of, uh, of, of, of our, our founder, Linus Pauling. Um, and this is a quote from him uh, talking about how um, optimum nutrition is really the medicine of tomorrow. Um, and hopefully uh, I can convince you that um, some of these nutrients that we get in our diet are, are really critical uh, to maintaining our health uh, both today and, and for many years to come. So today I'm going to talk to you more specifically about one of my favorite nutrients. Um, so zinc is uh, one of our essential nutrients. So it's required. Uh, our bodies don't make it. It's our bodies require it when we need to get it from uh, either foods or, and or supplements. Um, I often try to joke with my, my students. I, I teach here at Oregon State University in the nutrition program. And I, I often kind of tell them um, if you're on Jeopardy, um, and the answer is, um, this mineral is critical to X function. Um, your answer should always be, what is zinc? So zinc is an essential part of over 300 uh, different enzymes in the body. Um, it's associated with additional several thousand proteins and transcription factors. Um, and zinc is really critical for them to do their job. Um, so zinc is part uh, and important in a whole host of systems um, in, in the body. And again, um, it's hard to think of a function that doesn't in some way uh, need zinc. Um, at the cellular level, uh, zinc is really essential because it's part of so many of these proteins and transcription factors um, that it's important. So every cell that needs to divide needs zinc. Um, it's important in cell growth. It's also uh, plays an essential role in enzymes that help our bodies and our cell um, metabolize nutrients. Um, it's also important for factors um, that help our cells communicate with each other uh, through cell, cell signaling. So when we think about the systems, uh, the bodily systems that zinc affects, um, the ones that are uh, highly dependent on zinc tend to be those systems that have um, a high requirement for either cell division um, or cell uh, differentiation. Uh, so again, during growth, uh, uh, during uh, rep in reproductive systems, um, in our brain, um, several behavioral um, and parts of our, our, our brain um, need zinc as well. Uh, wound healing um, is another uh, essential uh, zinc um, containing process. Um, and today I'm gonna focus um, a little more specifically on how zinc is important uh, for our immunity and how it's a really a critical factor um, in, our, in, in our immune system. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, about zinc specifically. So what is zinc? Um, so again, it's a mineral. Um, so I have here, so if you can flash back to your uh, high school chemistry classes, uh, zinc is a metal or a, a mineral or a metal. So it's found in the periodic um, element um, table. Um, so it's here in the middle. Um, you'll notice it's right beside another mineral, copper, which it shares um, a lot of similarity with. And I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later in terms of um, some antagonism that um, they, they have because of their uh, similarities. Um, but zinc, you'll notice this yellow block um, are a grouping of elements called the transition elements. Um, so most of these elements uh, transition in that they donate electrons and transition between states. Um, zinc is a little bit unique in this that it is one of the few uh, transition elements that actually 
don't transition. Uh, so it doesn't lose electrons. Um, and this uh, special property of zinc um, really gives it some uniquenesses um, in terms of its ability to work. And in particular, um, because of this um, non-transitioning, uh, it acts as a factor uh, that really helps with stability. So it helps stabilize um, a lot of these enzymes um, so they can do their job. Um, so uh, things like transcription factors can bind to DNA. So again, they can do their job. Um, and the, the cells uh, and the body really rely on this stability uh, for maintaining optimal function. Another big function that's related to the stability is the fact that uh, zinc is a uh, uh, a strong uh, antioxidant. Um, and we've known, uh, you've probably heard about antioxidants in terms of their importance in health to help combat against um, free radicals and oxidative stress. Um, but even before we knew about the role of, of antioxidants in health, uh, we've known that zinc um, is a great antioxidant for, for decades and centuries. So when you look at um, something like this picture, uh, so this is a picture of galvanized, uh, galvanized steel and all gal uh, steel, this steel is, is that shiny layer is a zinc layer. Um, so that zinc um, that overlays the iron um, is basically keeping that metal shiny uh, and helping prevent oxidation, i.e. rust. Uh, by acting again as this, this stabilizing factor. So it's protecting the iron from oxidation, preventing rusting. Um, and we can kind of think of it uh, analogous to what zinc is doing in our body. Um, as we get older, as we uh, are exposed to stresses, that zinc is really uh, essentially helping protect our cells and our bodies from slowly rusting, aging, and um, leading to dysfunction. So there's a, um, that's definitely a bit of a oversimplification, but something to think about in terms of how, how, how zinc fun functions. We also, uh, so where do, where, do, where do we get zinc? Um, so zinc uh, requirements currently uh, are, if you're a male, 11 milligrams per day. Um, it's a little bit less if you're a female, uh, eight milligrams. Um, and zinc, again, is known to be uh, a pretty effective antioxidant, um, but it's one of the few antioxidants that you actually don't think green leafy vegetable as, as a great source. Uh, zinc actually follows, foods, food sources of zinc tend to be uh, protein rich. So zinc, in our own bodies um, and in a plant um, or other food sources uh, tends to complex with protein. Um, so it, the tendency is for protein rich foods, regardless of whether or not they're from animals or from plants, um, tend to be uh, sources that, that have more zinc. So things like lean meats, um, seafood, um, nuts and legumes, whole grains and cereals, again, these are, um, uh, vegetarian sources that tend to have more protein that tend to be the, the sources that have um, a little bit more zinc. Uh, one thing to note though, the vegetarian sources or plant-based sources uh, also tend to have another compound in them called phytate, um, which is a little bit of an anti-nutrient um, in that it will bind, bind zinc um, in your gut and make zinc a little bit less absorbable and bioavailable. Um, so, uh, there is some uh, thought that if, for example, you are a vegetarian or a vegan and all your sources come from plant-based sources, that you actually need to increase that, uh, the amount you eat by about 50% to account for this uh, decrease in bioavailability. So for a female, that, may, that means um, instead of uh, making sure you get uh, eight milligrams in your diet, you actually need 12 milligrams, you consume 12, so your body will be receiving that, that eight. Um, for another little bit of nutrition trivia, if you want to know what the, the food that has the highest amount of zinc uh, is, uh, they're oysters. Uh, so if you ever wanna come visit me here at Oregon State, I can take you out to the coast. We can have a couple oysters um, and that's easily your, your, your RDA or your requirement for zinc for, for, zinc for the day. So why do we care about zinc? Um, for the average person, you might not have thought about zinc in terms of something that you need to worry about, um, in terms of not getting enough. 
Uh, and hopefully after my presentation, this is something that you are gonna think a little bit more about. Uh, so the World Health Organization, the WHO, um, estimates um, that across the entire world, um, zinc deficiency affects about one third of the population. That's a lot of people. Um, developing countries um, are the ones that are hardest hit, um, but even in developed countries like North America, United States, uh, zinc deficiency um, is an issue. Um, in the United States, we don't see as much um, severe zinc deficiency. Um, we see more of a, a, a more subtle, um, what's called marginal zinc deficiency, um, but it is fairly prevalent. So it's estimated um, that about 12% of the population um, does not consume what they need um, in terms of uh, getting enough zinc. And I'll talk a little bit later, um, if you're over the age of 55, um, that number skyrockets up to 40 to 45% of the population um, is not getting um, adequate zinc. And one thing that I wanna point out, uh, again, zinc deficiency isn't often something um, that um, isn't on a lot of people's radars. Uh, and hopefully again, after you listen to me, that it'll be on your radar a little bit more. Um, but one thing um, that I'm gonna talk about in terms of the studies and one of the limitations is currently we don't have a reliable sensitive marker for zinc deficiency. So um, even if you are concerned about zinc deficiency, uh, the doctor will order uh, plasma or serum zinc. Uh, and I'll show you some data in a little bit um, that it is not a great marker um, and will miss a lot of this marginal zinc deficiency. Um, so a lot of uh, zinc deficiency may uh, in the clinic um, is likely to be uh, largely un un uh, underreported. Um, and I'll show you some data as well that I have that clearly shows that even this marginal deficiency um, has some pretty uh, functional consequences on your cellular health and especially that could be relevant to your immune system. So here, so what, what happens when your cells don't get enough zinc? Um, so these are some studies uh, that were done in the Lyons Pauling Institute, uh, where we simply took cells um, and fed them uh, a low, uh, low zinc food. Um, and this first graph shows um, I have a marker for oxidant stress. Um, so again, remembering that zinc is a good antioxidant. Uh, and we can show that when we don't have um, enough zinc in the cell, there's a massive increase in oxidants. Um, so lots of, of oxidant stress. When we look to see what that's doing to the cell, uh, we don't see some great things. So what this is, um, so this slide shows, this is an assay that I use in my laboratory um, that is uh, the called, it's called the comet assay um, because these things kind of look like comets. Um, what this assay does is you take cells, uh, you put them into a, a basic or alkali solution and that allows all the DNA to unwind. Um, and then you put it under an electric field. Uh, DNA is quite negative. So if you turn on the electricity, uh, DNA will start to migrate uh, to the, the, positive, uh, the positive field. And if the DNA is broken, so if it's damaged, you'll see uh, this comet form. Um, so comet in this case means bad. And what we can clearly see is on the left, we have cells that are, are again fed the normal adequate amount of zinc. Um, and then when I take away zinc um, from what they're being fed, we can see a significant increase um, in, in, in comets, which shows that the cells um, are being damaged. Um, and one thing that I wanna point out is uh, that the immune cells in particular are sensitive to this damage. And when these cells become damaged, uh, they're no, no longer able to function properly. The other thing that we also know is our cells actually get damaged all the time. Um, we have lots of different stresses um, and, uh, but we have several checks and balances in place in terms of systems to help repair um, that damage. Uh, one of those proteins that does this, uh, uh, this helping is a protein called P53, which is shown here. Um, so we can see uh, what these blobs show uh, is amount of P53. And we can see that in response likely to this damage that the blob is getting bigger, which says the cell is responding. Um, and able to uh, upregulate the protein that helps repair itself. Um, but 
The problem is, um, so this is a picture of what P53 looks like. Um, so this is the P53. Uh, for, for this protein to work, what it does is it needs to bind to DNA. Um, and then that is a signal that tells the cell make repair stuff um, and help repair the cell. This little dot is zinc. Uh, and what we find is when the cells uh, don't have zinc, that this process doesn't happen. The, the protein doesn't bind to the DNA properly. And hence all those, uh, the on button to say, repair me gets turned off. So in essence, this is a, a, a total double whammy where when you lose the zinc, not only do you create conditions that create more damage, um, but you also create conditions that the cell is not able to repair. So again, it's a big double whammy that ultimately ends up in more and more damage. Um, and again, uh, what I wanna emphasize is that the immune cells um, in particular are highly sensitive uh, to, to this damage. So who needs to worry about zinc deficiency? Um, as I mentioned before, um, a lot of the systems that really require zinc um, are ones of, of times of, of rapid growth and rapid cell division. Um, so there certainly is um, an increased susceptibility um, in, in childhood, for example, especially during high growth phases. Um, during pregnancy is another area of time uh, where the, the susceptibility to zinc deficiency is higher. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about what happens with zinc as we get older, because um, there's some unique um, things uh, that, that happen um, as, we, as we age that are um, specific to zinc. Um, so I already had told you uh, that that prevalence of, uh, of eating less zinc um, seems to be higher as we get older as well. Again, zinc tends to be in more of these uh, protein rich foods um, and that those types of foods do tend to, to decrease as we get older. The other thing that we also see is that there appears to be an age related loss uh, of ability to utilize and absorb zinc. So this slide shows as we age, there tends to be a, a drop in plasma zinc levels. Um, so basically that, uh, again, even if you are consuming um, a little bit more, more zinc, that you as an older individual may not retain it um, or ab absorb it as well. So again, it's this concept of another double whammy. Um, older individuals do tend to decrease um, the amount of zinc um, that they're eating in their diets and at the same time they're not utilizing it and that ha can have um, some pretty uh, significant consequences especially on the immune system. We already know that as we get older uh, age is associated with a compromised immune system and that um, immune system dysfunction uh, falls into several different categories in that there are things that are not working as well. Um, and at the same time, there's things that are becoming overactive and both um, have, have ill uh, consequences. So uh, we have a, a decrease of um, immune uh, diversity and development. Um, and at the same time, uh, that causes uh, individuals to be more susceptible to infections. Um, bacterial, um, viral infections, uh, and it also makes uh, you, uh, as an older individual, less uh, responsive in terms of vaccinations. At the same time, there are also components of the immune system that are overactive. And in particular, the overactivity uh, we see is related to inflammation. So chronic inflammation or this overactive immune system um, also occurs. Uh, so the, uh, again, with aging, we see increased susceptibility to infection, reduced vaccination efficacy, um, and then increased uh, chronic inflammation, which all can lead to core morbidities, increased sickness, and, and decreased quality of, of, of life. The interesting thing is if I uh, substituted zinc deficiency here, all these same symptoms would, would, would occur. Um, so we have been very interested in terms of the interrelationship uh, between uh, zinc um, and age-related um, immune dysfunction. Uh, so right now, currently the, in the US and uh, North America, the current recommendations for zinc, um, that eight to 11 milligrams is the same if you're 18 or if you're 100. 
Um, and we at the Institute are trying to establish that maybe similar to uh, calcium and vitamin D need to have a, an age specific requirement um, that, that's uh, maybe a little bit more elevated to compensate for this loss. Um, when we think about the immune system, the immune system is highly complex. Um, there are three basic categories of how uh, the immune sy system functions. So the first is uh, a prevention mechanism. Um, so this is what's called barrier function. Um, so these are things uh, like uh, the membranes in our nose and our skin and our gut that help prevent um, uh, microorganisms, bacteria or viruses to, to get into our system. Um, the second category of uh, defense mechanisms um, are more defense, um, and uh, they can be put into two subcategories. One, um, general defense. Uh, so these are things like white blood cells. Um, some of these cells literally um, spit out little bits of bleach um, into your system to help you know, fight off uh, bacteria and, and viruses, or they engulf them and, and kind of chew them up. Um, the other system is a little bit more specific. So these are things like antibody product producing cells um, that help you know, more specifically target specific organisms. The bottom line is uh, that zinc is critical for all of these functions. So again, um, the multi uh, facets of, of zinc um, applies to even within a, a single, single category. And again, if you're not getting enough zinc, you're going to have issues uh, in terms of your immune system defenses uh, at, at many, many, many different levels. Um, so one of the things that we've been able to show, so this is a study that we've done again here at the Institute looking at uh, young and old animals. So here, um, these are uh, mice that are either two months old um, or or 20 months old. Um, mice tend to live about two years old. So a 20 month old uh, mouse is, is a fairly old uh, mouse. And what we can show is on the left, I have plasma zinc levels. So we are in the green feeding these animals what we think is a zinc adequate diet. And these aged animals have a decreased level of zinc. Um, so even though we're giving them what we think is enough zinc, they look like they're zinc deficient. We can also show on the right, um, looking at inflammatory markers, that those older animals have a significant increase in inflammation. What's interesting is if we, in the yellow, um, give them a little bit of a zinc boost, um, a zinc supplement, um, that we can raise those plasma zinc levels back to um, their young counterparts. And at the same time, uh, we can see that we can um, uh, repair uh, or restore um, their, their immune function. Uh, and uh, we see a rapid decrease in that age-related inflammatory processes. Um, so the zinc um, is, is helping um, boost back uh, the, the immune system um, back uh, to more normal um, in, in a specific case. So again, zinc is highly required for the growth and development of, of our immune cells. So maintaining a healthy immune system, um, you need to make sure um, that you're getting enough zinc. Um, zinc is a, a critical factor for um, all those three components that I, that I, that I talked about. Um, and especially if you're an older individual, um, getting enough zinc from your diet might, might, might not be enough. Um, there's also some known effects of zinc as, as specifically an antiviral. Most of the work has been done in cold viruses. I'll talk a little bit more about other viruses in, in a moment, um, where it appears to have a little bit uh, or some um, antiviral activity by uh, decreasing viral uh, replication. Um, so if you feel a cold is coming on early, um, if you take zinc, um, you may be able to slow down uh, the progression or uh, decrease the, the time of, of, of symptoms. The one thing though is that you can get too much of a good thing. So the upper limit um, is 40 milligrams of zinc um, a day. Um, and you should really try not to get more of that um, in the combination of, of, of supplements and your diet. What uh, higher levels of zinc will do, so zinc by itself, um, again, um, it's a pretty stable molecule. 
um, not highly reactive. It by itself actually is, is relatively non-toxic. But the problem is that zinc is, again, kind of similar to that copper. Uh, and what happens at high dose zinc, so over this 40 milligrams, is that you can start to block the ability of your body to absorb copper. Um, so all the, the toxicity that's associated with uh, zinc deficiency, uh, sorry, zinc, zinc excess um, is copper deficiency. Um, and if you're not getting enough copper in your body as well, um, that is also an important factor um, in your immunity as, as well. Um, so you can get too much um, of, of a good thing. Um, the other thing that I want to mention, so the thought, so I can't emphasize enough, it's, it's, it's quite essential for you to be able to um, make sure you're getting enough zinc. Uh, what we don't know as much about is whether or not, if you already are zinc adequate, um, if you supplement more, if that's really going to boost your immune system um, anymore. So identifying populations that are at risk for zinc deficiency is, is really critical. Unfortunately, we don't have a great marker uh, for zinc um, yet. And I'll show you some. Um, so we did some studies in people um, where we, in this case, took healthy men, um, they're adults here, uh, and gave them um, a zinc um, adequate diet uh, for about two weeks. And then we transitioned them to uh, a zinc deficient diet uh, for about six weeks. Um, and then we gave them back zinc again. Um, for uh, an additional couple weeks um, as, as well. And we measured um, plasma zinc and various other things. So one thing I wanna point out, so here is the plasma zinc. So this is again, what your doctor will look at if they are concerned about uh, your, your plasma zinc levels. And you can clearly, hopefully see here that across all the dietary periods, the zinc levels are the same. Um, so again, in this middle area, I know that these individuals are not getting enough zinc. They're consuming a diet that's uh, about four milligrams of zinc, um, so definitely too low. Um, and that plasma marker um, that we're relying on to identify people that um, are at, at risk for zinc deficiency is, is not working uh, well. Um, however, when I look at some of that, uh, so we did that same comet assay um, looking for DNA damage, you can see um, so starting at the green here, um, so this is over time um, during the deficiency period, and you can see uh, that that DNA damage is, so even though the test says the person isn't zinc deficient, they're seeing um, some ill consequences of that low zinc diet, and namely uh, increases in DNA damage, and that DNA damage is in those white cells um, that I talked about previously that are important in the immune system. Good news, as soon as we gave them back zinc, the damage went away. Um, so this damage um, is reversible, um, and it's just, again, essential to know that you uh, are zinc deficient, um, and as soon as you replete yourself, you're, you're back to normal. Um, the other thing that I want to show you for the study, um, the other big thing that we saw was this big decrease here in this two-week period. Um, so in this study, what we tried to do is recruit people that we didn't think were zinc deficient. Um, but what we used was plasma zinc levels. Uh, so we think what were happening here is a high proportion of our subjects probably were zinc deficient and we just didn't know it. And then when we gave them that two week zinc adequate diet, we were able to correct some of that DNA damage. Um, so again, just illustrates that um, we need to uh, find some better biomarkers. And again, the importance of, um, even if the clinical test doesn't show that you're zinc deficient, um, to make sure you're getting enough zinc. In some cases, that may be a little bit of an insurance policy by taking uh, a multivitamin or multimineral that contains zinc. Um, and that's really all that you need to do. So again, why you should you take extra? Um, we don't have great biomarkers, um, so a lot of zinc deficiency may go un undiagnosed. Um, you can take zinc, especially if you have um, symptoms of a cold coming on um, as, as well. Um, you don't need to take anything special though. You do need to look though at the multi, so the taking your zinc as part of your multivitamin or with uh, that as part of your multivitamin multimineral is perfectly fine. Um, there's a lot of different forms of zinc. Um, some are a little bit better absorbed than others, but to be honest, the difference is generally 5% or less. So it's not a huge difference between um, all the various forms of zinc, but you do need to look at your label. 
Um, there are quite a few uh, multivitamin, multimineral formulations that actually don't have zinc in them. Um, my husband uh, once had the gall of coming home with a multivitamin that didn't have zinc uh, with it. So he very quickly was shoved back into the car, back at the store, returning it for me. Um, so you do need to look at your labels. Um, zinc, unfortunately, does have some, it's a metal um, and doesn't have a great taste. Uh, so some formulations intentionally take it out because of the, the taste characteristics. So you do need to, to, to take a look. Um, when or how should you take it? Again, um, form doesn't seem to matter too much. Um, zinc, um, similar to iron and copper, um, can make your tummy upset a little bit. So uh, generally it's not uh, good to take on an empty stomach and that's nothing to do with how it's absorbed. It's, it, it does tend to give you more of a, a tummy ache though. Um, I usually take my multivitamin actually in the evening uh, rather than first thing in the morning um, to ensure that I have uh, uh, food in my stomach before taking uh, the, the multivitamin. Um, again, Make sure, though, uh, to watch the amount. You can get too much of a good thing, and um, that can have a, a serious consequence um, on lots of various functions, and especially uh, your immune system. Um, uh, so stay under that, that 40 milligrams. Uh, higher amounts are okay short term, but no more than a couple days. So last thing I want to point out, um, and I know it's a question that um, I've been getting a lot and many are interested, you know, what about zinc and COVID-19? What's the evidence? Um, is zinc be beneficial for a bowel infection? So the evidence is yes. Again, making sure that you get adequate zinc is, is critical to support your immune system. Zinc also appears to have some effects um, in terms of viral rep replication. Um, so making sure you, you're not um, deficient is, is extremely important. Again, whether or not if you already are zinc adequate and super um, adding more zinc, whether or not that has a, a boosting effect is unclear, but certainly making sure that you prevent deficiency that is more prevalent than you think um, is important. Um, can zinc prevent or treat COVID-19? So a lot of the work with zinc and viruses has been done more um, in both the cold. Um, so the cold is either a, a coronavirus or a rhinovirus um, and in influenza. We just don't have the data yet in terms of how um, it affects COVID-19. And it, so it's a big maybe at this point. You definitely know, again, maintaining a healthy immune system, which is going to be critical in terms of either preventing um, and reducing the severity of COVID-19 is, is going to be um, important. Um, but its effects specifically on COVID-19 is, is still, still a little bit limited. I, I will say I did do a clinical trial search um, before this talk, and there's currently uh, about 10 different clinical trials looking at zinc either alone or in combination with things, uh, specifically with uh, COVID-19. Um, so the evidence, the, the premise is there, um, but we just don't have the evidence, especially in people yet, in terms of um, specific impacts. But bottom line, maintaining zinc um, for your immune system, which is going to be one of the big building blocks to help stop COVID-19, um, is, is going to be important. So. The facts are, um, make sure that you're getting enough zinc, bottom line. Um, you can take that zinc as, as a supplement, um, again, but make sure uh, that you're not getting too much is, is kind of the, the, the take home message. Um, zinc is important for the immune system again, um, but zinc alone um, is not ever going to be enough to prevent or cure COVID-19. We still have um, a lot to learn uh, about zinc um, and uh, flu, colds, and coronaviruses, um, and, and we are learning more every day. Um, again, there's, some, there's definitely some scientific premise um, and, and promise, um, but we're just not quite there yet in terms of the, the, the evidence and, and the data. But again, number one thing that you can do um, is, is make sure that you're getting enough zinc. Um, combination diets, and again, it's a little bit of insurance, uh, take a supplement, just make sure, um, again, you don't need to, don't, don't take too much, and there's nothing crazy that you need to do in terms of your zinc. Um, I also want to emphasize there's a lot of things that are going on in terms of your immune system. So zinc is just one of the tools um, in terms of maintaining immune system. Um, this is taken from an article from the Micronutrient Information Center, and I'll show this. But these are some other nutrients that are going to be really critical uh, for maintaining your immune system. Uh, ones in particular that you might want to consider in terms of um, making sure you... Uh, 
special attention that you're getting enough of. Zinc, of course, is one. Uh, vitamin D is another uh, that you might not be getting enough uh, from your diet. Um, DHA um, is, is another one that's, uh, that people tend to be a little bit more limited in, in terms of, uh, of their diet. And then vitamin C um, is another one that you might want to consider um, in terms of a, a, a little bit more. But again, generally a multivitamin, multimineral is, is going to be fairly sufficient um, in terms of helping uh, you meet these needs. Um, so the bottom line is a lot of the work that we're doing here at the Lyons Pauling Institute is, again, uh, with uh, taking our inspiration from Lyons Pauling um, and trying to help you take back charge of your, your health and help you live um, better longer. Um, these will be available to you um, as, as well. Um, here are some of the resources that I um, pulled from. Our Micronutrient Information Center, if you haven't seen it, is a fabulous resource in terms of lots of information on zinc and many of the other micronutrients. Um, we have a couple special articles on immunity um, and um, uh, on, on COVID uh, uh, specifically here as well. Here are those links. Um, and, and lastly, I just wanna thank you for your time and attention. Um, we'll have a time for a, a few questions as well, but again, here are some resources. You know, visit our website. Um, the Micronutrient Information Center that I just mentioned is celebrating its 20th year. Um, so you know, take, take a look in terms of a resource. Um, if you'd like to you know, support the Micronutrient Information Center or support our research at the, at the Institute as well, there's mechanisms on our website to, to get more information um, and uh, ways to support us. Uh, so thank you. I am gonna call uh, Casey back and we can look at uh, getting through some of these questions that you all have. Thanks, Emily. Um, fantastic talk, thank you. I, I will say that um, why I was in my void, I uh, laughed out loud about the story about your husband coming home and he had the gall to bring the wrong multivitamin. And that, in your world, that would absolutely be a no-no. So I'm, I'm glad that you had sent him back out to grab the correct one. So, it, but that was really funny. I, I really liked that story. Um, also, I, I had no idea about oysters. And I think that's just a great pub trivia question that, you know, at some point in time, that's going to get asked. And someone's like, I now know that. Thanks for this reason. So um, I want to talk about that a little bit, along with some other uh, good food sources for zinc. When you're talking about oysters, are you talking about raw or cooked? Does it matter? And how many are, how many is too many? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So for zinc, again, it's really stable. Um, so cooking um, doesn't affect the zinc levels. Um, we do know, though, for example, in uh, the grains that as you process, you start to lose the zinc as well. So more processed foods um, do tend to have le less zinc. Um, in terms of the oysters, uh, so the oysters, you definitely, um, if you ate a half dozen of oysters every day, you're going to be around above that 40 milligrams per day. So uh, for lots of reasons, I wouldn't recommend eating six oysters um, every every day all, all, all the time. Um, but uh, average, like, like I said, one, one uh, two to three oysters uh, would give you a little bit above that RDA of uh, 11 milligrams. Got it. And some other uh, good food sources for zinc that you would recommend for those yeah. who are huge oyster fans. Yeah. So again, think protein. Um, so the protein rich foods um, tend to be the foods um, that, that have more zinc. So um, Chicken, um, actually dark chicken has a little bit more than the uh, than, than white um, breast meat, um, lean, uh, lean meats, uh, and then from the plant sources, again, follow the protein. So nuts and legumes, um, beans, uh, and those whole grains. But again, for those vegetarian, if you're sole vegetarian and only getting your protein from uh, plant-based sources, that you do need to up um, your intake a little bit to account for that um, anti-nutrient effect of, of phytate that's going to decrease um, your ability to absorb. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I know you touched on this a little bit, but I, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper. We've had a few questions from people who are um, at or over the age of 50 and, and at or over the age of 70 about zinc supplements. And are, are there any are there any modifications? I know you had talked about um, in case you're not getting some of that animal protein about up and up, but what about as far as, as you continue on in those age brackets, does, does it, is there an appropriate change for the recommendation based on age as you continue to go? 
So currently there isn't um, an official uh, recommendation in terms of an age specific requirement for zinc. Um, I definitely recommend though, um, for most of my friends and colleagues that are um, older, uh, over the age of, 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 of 50, as you'd mentioned, um, to probably just as insurance, um, take that, that multivitamin, multimineral that, that contains zinc. Um, I usually ballpark you know, 10 to 15 milligrams um, is, is a good place to, to, to try to hit in terms of a supplement that usually will mean between the foods that you eat um, and the supplement that you're not at risk of, of going um, over, over too much. Okay. You know, I know you had mentioned some, some similarities between uh, zinc and copper, and a few of our uh, listeners have asked a little bit more about too much zinc can affect copper levels. I used to talk about that. Um, can you go a little bit further into um, the relationship between zinc, zinc and copper? Yeah, so it's all about what happens in your in your gut and the absorption. So when you take when you uh, take a high dose of zinc, for example, it induces a, a very specific protein called methylthionine that's in your gut, uh, and it will suck up the copper. Um, so when you take, when you have too much of that protein as a result of too much of high levels of zinc, it'll suck up the copper and make it stuck in your body. Um, so you won't absorb it. Um, so then all that copper that you have won't get into your body properly. Um, and you'll start to see signs of copper deficiency. And can you take more copper to counter the effects of too much zinc or are you just piling on at that point in time? Um, in theory, from a chemical standpoint, yes. Um, from a biological standpoint, largely because uh, there's a log full difference in zinc and copper levels. Um, so to kind of overcome it, the amount of copper that you would have to take uh, may in itself have, have issues uh, in terms of your biology. Right, right. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I know you had already touched on it as well, zinc and COVID. That's something that people are really, really curious about. Um, you know, during COVID, people have been interested in zinc in, as ionophores. Um, two people have asked about, you know, I'm going to butcher these, so I'm going to try to my best. Uh, quercetin and hydroxychloroquine. Can you comment in relation uh, to zinc yes. supplementation? Yeah, no, I get this a, a, a lot because there's been a lot of press about uh, these zinc ionophores. So first off, um, what is a zinc ionophore? Um, so these ionophores can be put into two, two different categories. Uh, one are kind of channel openers. So kind of think of that as a door opening um, that will allow zinc to come into the cell. Um, the other category of ionophore um, that, so chloroquine falls into that category. Um, the other one is, uh, so quercetin falls in the category of ones that bind zinc and help, is, help carry zinc potentially into the cell. So the premise is that again, because zinc plays such an essential role in your immune system and potentially has some antiviral effects, if, if you could get more zinc inside the cell, you may be able to slow down COVID. The issue is that the premise is there, um, but we still don't know enough in terms of if it actually is, that, if that strategy is doing that job. We can see it work well in a controlled system, um, cell culture, but we don't really know, have the, the whole picture in terms of what happens um, in the whole body. Um, so some of the analogies that I, that I use is, um, for the for chloric for these ionophores, for example, um, so those of you who do know me um, know I have a dog. His name is Bruno, and he has a very high affinity for slippers. Um, so the thought, the premise is, if my feet are cold, he should very efficiently be able to grab that slipper, get it to me, and my feet will be warm. For all of you who are dog owners, know very well that if I need my slippers, I am not certain that Bruno will bring it to me when I need them. I'm also not certain if he's going to even bring it to me at all, may take it somewhere else. And three, I also don't know if he's going to give up the slipper um, and give it, give it to me. And all of these are, same things apply to these ionophores as well. Um, and whether or not, again, we know that if we get more zinc into the cell, that's going to be a benefit. Um, but whether or not that ionophore is, is the key item or whether or not I just need to put slippers in every room of my house and have more slippers to keep my feet warm is, is the better strategy. Um, so there's still a lot of questions, bottom line. 
I, and I'm with Bruno. I'm all for slippers as well. So I, I like that. Um, you know, let's 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 stay in on a similar topic um, when it comes time to zinc and colds. And and I know you talked about with COVID that there's still a, you know a lot of data that needs to be out there. But let's so let's stick like with colds. Um, whether I'm taking a lozenge form or whether I'm doing a nasal spray, um, does it really matter about when along the point in time when I first start noticing symptoms, how far deep can I really go before, you know, it no longer really has any kind of effect? Does it matter when in that process I'm taking zinc? So two things there. Um, so when earlier is better. Uh, it's kind of like uh, with any disease or disorder, the, the earlier you can get your systems up and going again is going to be more beneficial. And as you go further in the continuum of severity, it's going to be harder to, to, to fight. Um, the other thing you had mentioned nasal. Uh, so I do not recommend any zinc going up your nose. Um, uh, that there's been clear studies uh, that show uh, that intranasal zinc um, does potentially cause irreversible loss in taste and smell. Uh, so uh, those forms do appear to be bioavailable and get zinc um, potentially you know, close to the virus and close to those immune cells, uh, that barrier function again, um, but there are some serious side effects. Uh, so um, nas intranasal zinc is not something that I recommend. Okay, so I'm trying not to use any brand names here. So like anything, uh, you know, you recommend the lozenge and definitely not the spray from whatever that zinc brand name would be. Is that yes. correct? Similar to some things, some things just don't belong up your nose directly. <laughs> I'm going to leave that one there. Um, are, are children at risk for any kind of zinc issues? Yes. Um, so as I mentioned, because of the high growth needs, um, children are susceptible to zinc deficiency. And actually worldwide, um, uh, with that, especially severe zinc deficiency, children are the ones that are that, that are most susceptible, um, and uh, are susceptible especially to uh, diarrheal diseases and, and gut infections, and that's a major issue in some of these developing countries. Um, there's been some links with low zinc intake uh, with growth trajectories um, as as well, um, failure to thrive, um, as well as. Um, immune system effects. Um, there's also been some work in terms of brain um, and cognitive function as well. So absolutely, uh, children do also need to make sure they're getting enough zinc as well. You know, there are many forms of zinc found in supplements. Is there a best form in your opinion? Yeah, and I had mentioned this. So um, there are lots of different forms of zinc. There are, there are zinc salts, um, like the zinc gluconate um, that are in those lozenges. Um, there are chelated forms of zinc. Um, there are also forms that are bound to amino acids that tend to be a little bit better absorbed. Um, again, the difference between all these forms is generally not that big, 5% or less. Um, so uh, paying for the more absorbable one um, isn't really making a, that much of a selective advantage. And I will also say that the more absorbed ones also tend to taste more metal-like. Um, so there is definitely a, a kind of the, the push and pull in terms of, do I actually want to take this um, for that little bit of increased absorption? Are there any drugs that interfere with the absorption of zinc? Um, there, are, so any drug um, that affects your GI tract um, um, may potentially uh, affect your ability to uh, absorb zinc, um, but uh, there aren't a lot of, there are uh, some conditions, uh, so some anti-malarial um, drugs, for example, that help move iron um, also um, interfere a little bit with zinc, but for the most part, unlike some of other uh, micronutrients, there aren't as many drug interactions that you need to worry about. You know, I know a lot of our participants uh, that are living in the Northwest right now don't necessarily have to deal with this next question right now, but definitely in the future, um, zinc and sunscreens, um, can it be absorbed through the skin? Is there a negative effect with zinc absorbed through the skin through sunscreen? Is there a positive effect that way? Uh, yeah, that's a tricky question. So is zinc from a sunscreen that you put on your skin uh, absorbed? Answer is yes, um, but not that much. Um, so you could not rely on um, diaper rash cream, uh, which is a zinc oxide, sunscreens as a means to make sure you're getting enough of zinc, uh, uh, bottom line. Um, the only uh, zinc oxide um, topical that has been correlated with some zinc toxicity are um, 
denture uh, solvents. Uh, but a lot of that also gets, uh, it's not just the topical, it's the fact that you also consume a little bit because it's in your mouth um, as, as well. Um, but uh, in terms of using a zinc-based uh, sunscreen, uh, very little risk in terms of zinc toxicity. You know, I know you talked a little bit about uh, zinc with food. Um, is it okay to take it on an empty stomach? Um, I know you had said that you try to take it with food one to two hours, um, but is it okay to take it with an empty stomach or do you really recommend like, yeah, make sure that hour or two after breakfast, lunch or dinner or whenever you're having it, that's the best way to go about it? Um, so in terms of absorption, there's not a big, a, a huge difference in terms of how much zinc your body will take in. Um, zinc does, uh, again, because it does follow protein. Um, if you're consuming it with your uh, shortly after a meal and you still have protein kind of in your body, that will enhance absorption. The main reason is um, if you are um, someone that does get a tummy ache um, as a result of taking zinc, which a high portion of people do, um, you're going to more likely get that tummy ache if it's on an empty stomach. Does, does zinc work well really in tandem with other vitamins such as vitamin D or vitamin C and gives you an extra boost in some way, shape or form? Uh, absolutely, in a lot of different ways. So again, thinking about the immune system, um, the immune system is pretty complex. So taking uh, a whole complement of your essential micronutrients, zinc, uh, vitamin D, uh, C and A, uh, they all hit the different parts of the immune system. Um, so together help the whole, whole system. Um, but um, again, of those 300 proteins um, that zinc's a part of, a lot of them are things that metabolize or help vitamins or other minerals do their job as well. Um, so uh, there is definitely some interrelationship between, between them, uh, both directly and indirectly. Wonderful. And, and last question, Emily, and, and this one will probably be the most softball-ish, but then again, you've handled each one of these fantastically. Uh, where can people go? if they want more information on zinc. And maybe perhaps you'll know about some other places for other vitamins as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd mentioned the, the Micronutrient Information Center at the Linus Pauling Institute is, is my go-to resource for any of the micronutrients, um, including zinc. Um, the Office of Dietary Supplements at the National Institute of Health um, also has a great page in terms of uh, information on supplemental, lots of things, um, including zinc. Um, I believe we'll have a, a lot of the links um, available um, to both the zinc article at the Micronutrient Information Center and some of these um, at, in, the, uh, in the Micronutrient Information Center, you can also search on conditions as well. So if you're worried about heart disease, um, your immune function, um, you can go to those as well and then look at the host of nutrients that affect, or you can go the other way, look at a specific nutrient and see what processes it, it's involved in. You know, I know we got a lot of questions beforehand. We have a lot of questions in the live chat. People are, are really, really into zinc more so than I ever knew. Um, again, email lpi at oregonstate.edu if you didn't get your question um, answered today. But uh, Dr. Ho, thank you very much for your time. Um, and thank you to everyone for your fantastic and engaging questions. Uh, we will be sending up a follow-up note that includes a link to this recording um, of, of this webcast that's recorded so you can share it with your family or friends who weren't able to join with us today. Additionally, we will also send a very quick and easy survey. Um, we greatly appreciate your feedback so we can continue to bring you this type of content um, that you want to see more from OSU via the Alumni Association and the OSU Foundation. So uh, those two things, again, more things coming your way, but the survey is really, really helpful for us. Thank you. I also invite you to head over to the OSU Alumni Association's website and register for the next webcast of the Changemakers series taking place on December 14th at 5 p.m. for a conversation with Indigenous activist and Assistant Director of the OSU Native American Longhouse, Luhui White Bear. For more information, please visit osualum.com. We always have a lot more uh, things going on between the Foundation Alumni Association and our partners on campus. That is all for tonight. So on behalf of, of Emily and the rest of us here, please have a very safe and happy holiday season. I and the rest of my colleagues look forward to seeing you all again in the new year. Please take care. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thanks, Inc. <laughs>